Welcome to Business Funding 101. In today's video, we'll be covering the topic, how to become fundable. My name is Threon and I'll be your host for today. Now, who is this for and who will benefit from this video? Whether you're a current or aspiring business owner looking to launch or grow your venture, this training is tailored just for you. Even if you're simply seeking a deeper understanding of credit and funding, you're in the right place. Let's embark on a journey to unlock the keys to financial success for your business aspirations. So what's on the agenda for today's video? We'll be going over four key things. What is the ideal personal credit profile? The correct structure for your business when seeking funding? How to build long-lasting, profitable, fruitful relationships with lenders? And four credit unions that you can access $10,000 in funding right now. All right, let's get into it. What does it mean to be fundable? A fundable business is one that investors like because it has a clear plan, a good chance to grow, a skilled team, a unique product, it shows progress, and most importantly, it handles money well. Investors will consider a business as fundable if they see that they will be able to get a good return on their investments. Lenders look at your business as fundable if they see that you will be able to repay them on time, all right? Now, why do you want to become a fundable individual and have a fundable business? The main reason is because you want to have access to capital and resources that you can use to launch new ventures and to scale. Now, why do you want to be fundable? Why do you want to be a fundable individual and why do you want to have a fundable business? So the main reason you want to be fundable is to be able to access capital when you need it. This could be to launch new ventures or to scale your existing ones. Majority of businesses, over 50%, do tend to fail within the first five years. The main reason for this is a lack of capital. So you want to put yourself in a position where you always have access to the finances that you need to keep your businesses afloat and to start new ventures as well as take advantage of new opportunities that might present itself to you. All right, so this is the main reason why you want to be fundable and this is what a fundable business is considered as. Now, what exactly makes your business fundable? There are two sides to becoming fundable. The first is your personal credit profile and the second is your business structure. Both of these needs to be set up in the correct way so that lenders will see you as someone they can rely on to repay them if they do offer you funding. Now, we just touched on your personal credit profile and we see that it's an important component in the process of becoming fundable. So let's take a look at what's actually on your personal credit profile and let's dive a little bit deeper into it. Your credit profile is a summary of your credit history and financial behavior. It typically includes several key components, including your credit report. Your credit report. This is a document that provides detailed records of your credit history, including information about your credit accounts, payment history, credit inquiries, and public records such as bankruptcies. Credit reports are maintained by credit bureaus such as Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion, and they are used by lenders to assess your credit worthiness. The second thing that you're going to see on your credit profile is your credit score. This is a numerical representation of your credit worthiness. It usually range, ranges from 300 to 850 when you're living in the United States. And it is calculated based on information on your credit report and is used by lenders to quickly assess your credit risk. A higher credit score is generally considered more favorable. Now, you're also going to see your personal information on your credit profile. This will include details such as your name, your address, date of birth, and employment information. Another thing that's going to be on your credit profile is your credit accounts. This includes information about your credit, credit accounts, your credit cards, loans, mortgages, and other types of credit. This section includes details on account balances, credit limits, and payment history. On your credit profile, you're also going to see a more detailed breakdown of your payment history. This is a record of your payments on credit accounts. It indicates whether you've made payments on time, missed payments or had late payments. A positive payment history contributes to a higher credit score. And as you're gonna see a little bit later on, your payment history makes up for about 35% of your actual credit score. Next on your credit profile, you're also gonna see your credit inquiries. This section lists the inquiries made by lenders when you apply for credit. Too many recent inquiries may negatively impact your credit score as it could suggest financial stress or a high reliance on credit. So you want to keep your inquiries to a minimum. Also on your credit profile, you're going to see public records. This includes information on bankruptcies, 
and other legal financial matters. Public records can significantly impact your credit score and how lenders view your credit worthiness. Now, another big thing that you're going to see on your credit profile is your credit utilization. So this compares your credit card balances to the credit limits. A lower credit utilization is generally better for your credit score as it suggests that you have responsible financial and credit management, right? An example of your credit utilization, let's say you have a credit card with a limit of $1,000. Let's say you spent $300 from that credit card, that would put your credit utilization at 30%. Generally, you want to keep your credit utilization below 30% and for the best course of action, you want to keep it below 10%. All right. The ninth thing that you're going to see on your credit profile is the length of credit history. The average age of your credit accounts influences your credit score. A longer credit history can be beneficial as it provides a more comprehensive picture of your financial behavior. Now, the 10th and final thing that you're going to see on your credit profile is the types of credit. The mix of credits on your account such as credit cards, installment loans, and mortgages. A diverse credit mix can positively impact your credit score. Now, something you must take note of. Monitoring and maintaining a positive credit profile is important as it affects your ability to qualify for loans, credit cards, and other financial products, as well as the interest rates you may be offered. Regularly reviewing your credit report and addressing any inaccuracies is a good practice to ensure the accuracy of your credit profile. All right, so in a nutshell, this is what your credit profile is, your personal credit profile, and this is what you can expect to find on your credit profile, all right? Now, we just mentioned your credit score, and this is gonna be on your credit profile, and this is gonna be one of the main things that lenders are gonna take a look at when deciding whether or not to afford you credit. There are different types of credit score and scoring models, but in general, when you're seeking funding, they're gonna be taking a look at your FICO score. Your FICO score is a widely used credit scoring model. It is based on several key factors. The FICO score is calculated using information from your credit report and the components that make up your FICO score it may include your payment history. As mentioned earlier, your payment is history accounts for 35% of your FICO score. This is the most significant factor and accesses your track record of making payments on time. Late payments, default, bankruptcies, and other negative information can have a detrimental impact on your credit score. The second thing you're gonna see on your FICO score is your credit utilization. The second thing that you're gonna see on your FICO score is your credit utilization. This makes up 30% of your FICA score. This factor considers the ratio of your credit card balances to your credit limits, as I mentioned earlier. A lower credit utilization ratio is generally favorable and indicates responsible financial management. And as you can see, your payment history and your credit utilization makes up 65% of your FICA score in total, right? So you need to pay attention to these two uh, specifically. Now, the third thing that goes into making up your FICA score is the length of your credit history. And this accounts for about 15% of your score. The length of time your credit accounts have been established influences your FICO score. A longer credit history is generally viewed as more positive. You're also going to see the types of credit in use or your credit mix. This accounts for about 10% of your FICO score. And this factor, it takes a look at the variety of credit accounts you have, including credit cards, installment loans, mortgages, and so on. A diverse mix of credit is always beneficial to your credit score, right? Lastly, accounting for about 10% of your credit score is new credit. This considers the number of recently opened credit accounts and the frequency of recent credit inquiries. Opening multiple credit accounts in a short period of time may be seen as a high risk. All right, so your FICA score ranges from 300 to 850, like other scoring models. And with higher scores, it usually suggests that you have more credit worthiness. The weight of each factor can vary based on individual credit profiles and specific impact of negative information may depend on factors like severity, recency, and frequency, right? So, and let's say you have some late payments on your account. So if you have frequent late payments, this will have a greater negative impact on your credit profile as opposed to let's say one or two late payments, right? So you wanna stay on top of that. Now, it's important to note that while the FICO score is widely used, there are other credit scoring models like the Vantage score model and lenders may use variations of these models right additionally each credit bureau equifax experian and transunion may generate its own version of the fico score based on information in its credit reports now regularly monitoring your credit report as i said before and understanding these factors can help you manage and improve your credit score over time so you have to stay on top of that all right so we understand better what is your credit profile and what's on your credit profile we also understand what is your fico score and what goes into making up your 
FICO score. Now let's take a look at what makes up the perfect credit profile. While there is no one size fits all definition for a perfect credit profile, lenders generally look for certain attributes that indicate responsible financial behavior. Here's a list of factors that contribute to a strong and attractive credit profile. First up, you want to have excellent payment history, consistently making on-time payments on all credit accounts including credit cards, loans, and mortgages. This contributes positively to your credit profile. Second, you want to have low credit card utilization. So you want to keep your credit card balances low in comparison to credit limits, demonstrating responsible credit usage. And this is all on the personal side, all right? And you want to basically keep your credit utilization below 10%. Third, a good credit profile has a good credit history. So a well-established credit history with a mix of credit accounts showcasing a track record of responsible credit management over an exper extended period of time. You also want to have a diverse mix of credit types. Having a variety of credit types such as credit cards, installment loans, and mortgages can positively impact your credit profile. Number five, this is super important. You want to ensure that when you're seeking funding, there are no negative remarks on your credit profile. A clean credit report without bankruptcies, foreclosures, repossessions, or other significant negative entries like late payments is superb. Now, the next thing that contributes to a positive credit profile is your ability to demonstrate stable income or steady employment. A steady job and a consistent income provides lenders with confidence in your ability to repay borrowed funds. The perfect credit profile will also have limited new credit. So you want to avoid opening too many credit accounts in a short period of time. As mentioned before, this may be perceived as financial instability. So basically, lenders don't want to see that you're running around asking everyone for money because this will suggest that you don't manage money well or that you're having some financial problems and they won't want to work with someone with financial problems. Next up, if you want to have a good credit profile, you're going to want to keep your debt to income ratio very low. Maintaining a reasonable ratio of debt to income, demonstrating your ability to manage financial obligations, this contributes, contributes positively to your credit profile and shows lenders that you are responsible and you'll be able to manage whatever sum of money they are able to afford to you, all right? Now, number nine, if you're going to have a good credit profile, you need to regularly monitor your credit report. Being proactive in monitoring your credit report for inaccuracies and addressing any discrepancies is key to good credit health, all right? Now, the last thing that you're going to want to have is a good credit score. You're going to want to ensure that your FICO score is 680 and above. Anything in the range of 750 and above is considered as great. So you want to keep a good credit score as well. Now, important to note, different lenders prioritize factors based on their criteria and the type of funding sought. A perfect credit profile is desirable, but overall financial health and business plans, as well as funding purpose, also influences a lender's decision. Now, this was a quick look at what makes up the perfect credit profile. So if you're weak in any of these areas, you need to work on that. And if you're strong in any of these areas, keep up the good work. All right, let's say for instance, you had a poor credit profile. This section, we're going to talk about how you can boost your credit profile, all right? So this is just a quick synopsis. And to enhance a poor personal credit profile, you need to take proactive and disciplined approaches. First off, you need to get copies of your credit reports from all major bureaus, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. You need to dispute any inaccuracies with supporting documentation. And you need to prioritize paying off delinquent accounts and negotiating debts if necessary. Create a realistic budget, allocating funds to clear your debts, pay all your bills on time, set reminders, and automate your payments. You need to lower your credit card balances to improve utilization, focusing on high interest debts first. Now, something very important when it comes to building a good credit profile. I want you to understand this instinctively. Patience is key. A good credit profile is like Rome. It will not be built in a day. However, it can be destroyed in a day. So you need to practice consistent positive financial behaviors as over time this will gradually improve your credit. Educate yourself on credit management, Fair Credit Reporting Act, and credit score calculations. Alright, so patience is a virtue. Now, when it comes to seeking funding, it's important to have as few as possible negative remarks on your credit profile. If you have a lot of negative remarks in your credit profile, you're going to want to fix your credit profile or enhance it 
before you actually go out and seek funding. This is something that you can do on your own or you can get a professional to assist you with it. In this next section, I'm gonna touch on a method that myself and my team has been using to assist our clients with removing negative items from their credit profile and enhancing their credit profile. And this is the Metro 2 compliance method. Now, I also want to stress that there is no one method to enhancing credit profiles. So there is factual disputing, Metro 2 compliance, and consumer law, etc., etc. You're going to want to educate yourself and as many on as many of these methods as possible, or you're going to want to get a professional that is well versed in these different methods to be able to get you the best results over time. However, my team primarily focuses on the Metro 2 compliance method because it has been proven to be super, super effective, and I'm going to show you why in just a second. Okay. So what exactly is Metro 2 and how does it work in your favor? So the Metro 2 compliance method is a set of standardized procedures and reporting guidelines established by the Metro 2 format. This format is an industry standard used by creditors, lenders, credit bureaus to report consumer credit information accurately. Adhering to the Metro 2 compliance ensures that the information on your credit report follows a consistent and standardized format. Now, think of the Metro 2 compliance method as a set of rules in a game. The game is creating and maintaining accurate credit reports. When all players, creditors, lenders, and credit bureaus follow the same rules, the game is fair and the credit reports are accurate. If there are any inaccuracies or errors on your credit report, using the Metro 2 compliance method to challenge them is like pointing out violations in the rules. Now, this is where it gets good. If there are inaccuracies or errors on your credit report, or if there's anything reporting on your credit profile that wasn't reported following the standardized rules set out in the Metro 2 compliance format, then you're basically able to point out these violations and say, hey, according to the rules that we agreed upon, this information is not accurate or it was not reported following the set standards. So it needs to be removed and it needs to go right away. So now you can leverage the Metro 2 compliance to your advantage when challenging inaccuracies. By pointing out discrepancies in the way the information is reported, whether it's about payment history, account status, or other details, you're essentially saying, let's play by the rules and let my credit report reflect my financial story accurately. Creditors and credit viewers are expected to follow these standardized rules. And if they deviate, you have the right to dispute these violations and deviations using the Metro 2 compliance method. It's a way to ensure fairness and accuracy in the portrayal of your credit history, much like making sure everyone in the game follows the agreed upon rules. All right, so how can you actually make use of the Metro 2 compliance method and have this work in your favor? Basically, the Metro 2 compliance method is where you're going to go ahead and create Metro 2 compliance letters to challenge inaccuracies or reported items that are on your profile. There are softwares out there that you can use to get this done, or you can hire a professional who knows this method. So if you're interested in learning more about the Metro 2 compliance method, comment the word Metro 2 below, and I'm definitely going to reach out to you or a member of my team is going to reach out to you. We're going to provide you with guidance on how you can do it on your own. Or if you're looking to get someone to do it on your on your behalf, we can definitely assist you with that as well. All right. So now let's do a quick recap of everything we've covered so far for a brief refresher. All right. So, so far, we've taken a look at the role your personal credit profile plays in helping you to secure funding that you may need for your business. And we also looked at what lenders are looking for when they're considering if they're going to give you any kind of credit. We also discussed the importance of having a good credit profile, cleaning up your credit profile and the Metro 2 compliance method. So that's a quick breakdown of your personal credit and what it needs to be like if you're going to seek funding, if you're going to become fundable. In the next section, we're going to take a look at the business side. We're going to look at how to set up your business entity and so on. So let's continue. Let's talk a little bit about structuring your business for funding. Getting funding for a business is like giving it a power boost. It brings in money for things like growing your business, hiring more people, and getting better equipment. This helps your business get bigger and more competitive. It also provides a safety net so if things get tough, you have some financial support. With this money, you can make your operations smoother and even come up with new ideas or products to stay ahead of the game. Plus, it's not just about money. It helps you build a financial reputation, a good financial reputation, and it gives you room to make decisions, attract talented people to work with you, and so on. Getting business funding isn't just about cash. It's a smart move that can make your business stronger in many ways. And there are many iconic companies today that started out with business funding. Some of these companies are Google, 
Facebook, Amazon, Twitter, Netflix, Airbnb, Uber, and even Apple. We also have Microsoft and Tesla. All of these companies started out with some form of business funding and they used that money, that financing to propel their business into the iconic companies that they are today, making billions of dollars each month. So I just wanted to put this here for you to understand that with the correct amount of funding, with the right funding strategy, you can actually take your business to new heights. And if you use credit wisely, right, if you leverage your credit wisely, it can take you from wherever you are now to where you want to be. Also, I want to say this as well. The world is becoming more credit based. So if you have good credit, good personal credit or good business credit, you should be leveraging that credit in order to take advantages of opportunity that might be present to you or to strengthen your financial position and elevate your businesses, right? The world is becoming more credit based. Those with good credit will have good businesses and good lives. Those with poor credit will have poor businesses and poor lives. So work on your credit and take advantages of the opportunities that credit do provide for you. All right, so just wanted to share that little bit there. Now let's take a look at how we can navigate business funding. And first of all, let's take a look at the different funding options available to us. Now, financial institutions such as banks and credit unions offer various types of funding for your business. This includes business credit cards, business lines of credit, and business loans. Each of these serve a different financial need. Here's an explanation of these funding options. First up, we have business credit cards. Business credit cards provide a convenient way to manage day-to-day -day expenses, make purchases, and separate personal and business finances. They often come with expense tracking tools, reward programs, and benefits. Approval for a business credit card typically depends on both your personal and business credit histories. Lenders may also consider business revenue, years in operation, and the owner's financial stability. Business credit cards offer flexibility, quick access to funds, and the ability to build a business credit history, which is super important. They are suitable for smaller ongoing expenses and can help with managing cash flow. The second funding option that we have here is business lines of credit. Business line of credit provides a predetermined amount of money that a business can draw from as needed. Interest is only charged on the amount withdrawn. It's a flexible financial option or flexible financing option for short-term working capital needs. So the requirement for business lines of credit. Financial institutions will assess your business credit worthiness, financial statements, cash flow, and the owner's credit history. A solid business plan and a demonstrated ability to repay are crucial factors. So some benefits of business lines of credit. Business lines of credit offer flexibility, allowing businesses to access funds when needed without committing to a huge amount. These are suitable for managing fluctuations in cash flow, covering seasonal expenses or season opportunities. Next up, we have business loans. So this is another form of credit that you can access on the business side. So business loans provide a huge amount of capital that is rapid over a fixed period of time, often with a predetermined interest rate. Loans are suitable for specific purposes like expansion, equipment purchases, or large investments. So the requirements for getting business loans. Banks are going to evaluate the business's financial health, credit history, cash flow, and the purpose of the loan. Collateral may be required for secured loans and the owner's personal credit worthiness may also be considered. So again, we see how personal credit is important. Now, some of the benefits of business loans. Business loans offer a substantial amount of capital for larger investments or projects. The fixed repayment structure allows for better budgeting and the interest rates can be competitive, especially when you have good personal credit and business credit as well. Now, let's take a look at how to go about getting approved for these funding options. To increase your chances of approval, it's crucial to maintain good personal and business credit. You need to have a solid business plan and demonstrate consistent cash flow as well as provide relevant documentation. Understanding the specific requirements for each funding option and aligning them with your business needs will help you choose the most suitable financial solutions. Additionally, building a strong relationship with your bank can enhance your chances of securing favorable terms and conditions. Now, you might have already figured this out, but to do business, you actually need to have an established and registered business. To secure funding for your business, it is essential to establish a well-structured business entity, such as an S-Corp or an LLC or a C-Corp nonprofit organization and so on. Typically, small businesses opt for LLCs or S-Corps. 
it is advisable to consult a tax professional to determine the most suitable business entity tailored to your specific needs and financial goals. All right, so speak with your tax professional to determine what business entity type will be best for you before you dive in. All right, so to do a business, you need a business. You need to have a registered business entity, okay? All right, creating your business entity. These are the things you're gonna need to create your business entity. You're gonna need a business name, a business address, a business phone number, business website and email address. You're also gonna need an EIN number, articles of organization and operating agreements. The EIN number, articles of organization and operating agreements are crucial when you're setting up an LLC and going to seek funding. You also need your EIN number to open your business bank accounts, all right? So first up, we have your business name. Selecting a distinctive and professional business name is crucial for effective branding and securing funding. Utilize online tools like namechecker.com to verify the availability of your chosen name across various social media platforms. Ensure the corresponding domain name is also accessible for your business website. Additionally, be cautious when you're choosing a business name. You want to avoid business names in high-risk industries such as real estate, credit, or trucking to prevent potential complications. Basically, high-risk industries are not supported by financial institutions. If you choose a name, let's say, John's Real Estate Company, you're not going to get any funding from any financial institution. They're going to consider that as a high-risk industry. Think about it when you're choosing your business name and you want to be professional and very distinctive so that you can brand yourself and stand out in a crowded market. Next up, we need a professional real business address. So having a real business address, especially for an LLC, is super important. It keeps you in line with the rules, make your business look more trustworthy and handles important paperwork and legal stuff. A dedicated business address also helps keep personal and business things separated and gives your business a solid presence. Picking the right address is a smart move and you can use services like regus.com for a virtual address if you don't have a physical one. Remember, your business address cannot be a PO box, it cannot be a home address. And it's best if it's not shared with other businesses to avoid issues later on. If you're not sure about a physical address or a virtual address, think of getting a registered agent in your state as this is also a viable option. In addition to having a good business name and business address, you need a business phone number. Having a real business phone number is essential, especially when seeking funding, as it enhances your professionalism and builds trust with potential investors and lenders. A dedicated business number ensures reliable communication, separates personal and business calls, and signals that your business is well prepared and committed. Platforms like grasshopper.com offer convenient solutions for obtaining a professional business phone number, contributing to a polished and credible image during the funding process. All right, so you do need a professional business phone number as well. Your cell phone is not going to work. Now, you also need a business website and email address. Securing a professional business website and email address is vital for your business entity, especially when you're seeking funding. It enhances your credibility and professionalism, and it is crucial for impressing potential investors and lenders. Namecheap.com is an excellent platform for obtaining a business domain and setting up your professional email address. It also ensures a reliable online presence. I really like Namecheap.com, it's only $10 a year for a domain and they give you two months free for your business email address. Then it's about $5 per month, so about $60 per year for the business email address. So it's very affordable, it's easy to use and your support team is super, super good. So Namecheap.com is highly recommended on my side. Also, you want to check out platforms like Fiverr.com if you're seeking someone to professionally develop your website and to align your online image with your brand. Now, I want to say this as well, if you're in the market for a professional website to be built out, our team here at VirtueFinancials.com, we do assist with website design. So if that's something that you're interested in, comment the word website below or send me a message and I'll definitely, definitely uh, reach out to you and assist you with getting your website set up. All right. Now, a business website and email address. These things not only build trust, they will also facilitate clear and organized communication essential factors that can positively impact the funding process, right? So this goes a long way in helping you to secure the amount of funding you need and getting you the maximum amount of funding as well. Now, think for a second. Any professional business that you work with, they all have a professional website. All members of that company all have their own business email address relating to that company. 
So when you're going in for funding, you want to set up yourself as a real professional business, a business website and email address goes a long way uh, towards that end. All right. Once you have all of that set up, you're going to want to get an EIN number. An EIN number, also called an employer identification number, is a unique nine digit identifier assigned by the IRS to businesses and other entities for tax purposes. This number is crucial for various financial transactions, including opening a business bank account, filing taxes, and applying for business credit. Obtaining an EIN is free, and businesses can apply online on the IRS website, irs.gov. The application process is straightforward. It typically requires basic information about the business, such as its structure, purpose, and the number of employees. An EIN is essential for legal and financial transactions, serving as a distinct identifier for a business entity in the eyes of the IRS and other government agencies. Some people like to say that the EIN is your business's social security number. So you can think of it as, as that as well. Now, we spoke about your articles of organization. This is essential as well. Articles of organization is a key document for an LLC. It is filed with the state to establish its legal existence. It contains vital details like the LLC's name, purpose, structure, registered agent, and sometimes its members and managers. This document is crucial as it officially creates the LLC as a distinct legal entity, offering recognition and protection. Serving as the foundation for operations, the Articles of Organization are required for state registration, ensuring compliance with laws. Clear documentation also helps avoid misunderstandings amongst members and provides a basis for legal and financial decisions. So that was your Articles of Organization. And now let's take a look at your operating agreement. An operating agreement is a crucial legal document for a limited liability company, your LLC. It outlines internal rules and structures. While not always mandatory, it establishes key aspects such as member roles, profit distribution, decision making. This document is essential for managing internal affairs, preventing disputes, and defining the rights and responsibility of LLC members. It serves as the foundational guide for the company's operation. Now, you can do this all on your own. It's not very hard to set up. There are many resources online that teaches you how. Now, if you need a more detailed, more comprehensive guide where I actually show you step by step how to set up this business entity, how to get all of these moving pieces in place, comment the word business entity below and I'll reach out to you with some more information and show you step by step how to get this all set up. All right. Now, let's take a look at how we can actually go about filing for your business entity. Individuals can file their business entity on their own by visiting the official website of the Secretary of State or equivalent state agency in the state where they intend to operate. Each state has its own online portal or business registration system where you can find the necessary forms, guidelines, and instructions for filing. So basically, you can just search in Google for LLC registration in whatever state you want to operate in. So for example, LLC registration in Philadelphia, you're going to find the relevant information there and you can just follow the steps to get your entity registered and filed for. Additionally, you can hire a professional, a professional company. There are many of them online, or you can just work with the virtue financial teams. Just get in touch with us if you're interested in having us create your business entity for you. Okay. Now let's take a look at the general steps if you want to do this on your own. So the first step is you want to go to the official website for the secretary of state or the relevant state agency responsible for business registration. Then you want to look for a section related to business services or business filings. This is where you'll find the information and forms for registering a new business entity. You're going to want to choose your business structure that suits your need, example, a LLC, and you want to locate the corresponding registration forms. You want to fill out the necessary forms with accurate and complete information. This typically includes details about your business name, your purpose, your structure, registered agent, and other relevant information, such as your business address. Next, you need to check the availability of your chosen business name on the state's business registry. You may need to choose an alternative name if your preferred name is already in use. From there, you're going to want to follow the website's instructions to submit completed forms. This may include uploading electronic documents or mailing physical copies. This all depends on the state's requirements. Next, you're going to want to pay the required filing fees online using the provided payment options and fees may vary by state and business structure. After submitting your forms and payment, you should receive a confirmation of your business registration. This confirmation may include a filed copy of your formation documents. Keep copies of all filed documents, receipts for filing fees, and confirmations received. 
These documents are crucial for future references and compliance. Lastly, you're going to want to check for additional requirements. Be aware of any additional requirements specific for your business type or industry. Some states may have extra steps or regulations for certain professions. Also, you must be aware of the Corporate Transparency Act that comes into play in January 2024. So you definitely need to speak to your tax professional or your legal professional about setting up your entity and the required uh, steps that you need to follow once the entity is actually set up. All right, so in a nutshell, that's the basic process for filing for your business entity and getting everything set up. Again, if you need further assistance with this, you need a more detailed overview, step-by-step -step process, let me know in the comments, comment business entity below, or if you want us to assist you with getting your business entity set up, let us know, we can definitely help. Now, something important to note, remember that specific processes can vary by state. It is essential to carefully follow the instructions provided on the official state website. Additionally, consider seeking legal or professional advice to ensure you're meeting all the necessary requirements for your business entity registration. All right, so just keep that in mind. So now we have our business entity fully established. Our personal credit profile is looking good and we are ready for funding. The first thing we need to do is understand where we can access funding. I do recommend banks and credit unions. Here's why. Banks and credit unions are excellent options for business owners to secure funding because of their established relationships, diverse funding choices, and competitive interest rates. These financial institutions provide personalized service, offering businesses advice and resources. They are trustworthy and regulated, plus they contribute to building a positive business credit history. So this is very important, building positive business credit history. With flexibility in funding solutions, they can tailor financing options to meet various business needs. Now, careful consideration of financial situation and needs will help you determine the most suitable funding source. All right, so depending on your need, you will know where to go to get funding. Now, these financial institutions are grouped into several different tiers, which is important for you to understand. The first tier, tier one, these are your national banks or worldwide banks. These are the largest and most prominent banks with a significant presence both nationally and worldwide. They are referred to as money centers or big banks. Examples include JP Morgan Chase, Bank of America, and Wells Fargo. These banks typically offer a wide range of financial services, including retail banking, investment banking, and asset management. These are your big banks. The second tier, tier two banks, these are your regional or community banks. Regional and community banks operate within specific geographic regions. They serve local communities and sometimes larger regions. Examples of regional banks are Regions Bank, SunTrust Banks, and these banks often focus on retail and commercial banking services. Now the third tier of financial institutions in America, these are your community banks and your credit unions. This tier includes smaller community banks and credit unions that primarily serve local communities. Community banks are typically independent and locally owned, while credit unions are member-owned financial operatives. So that's very important to note there. Credit unions are member-owned. And what does this mean? It means that members of credit unions, they are the primary shareholders in the credit union, and credit unions exist to enrich their members. So this is why credit unions often offer more favorable terms, higher limits, and so on. All right, so remember that credit unions are member-owned. Now your tier three institutions are known for personalized service and community involvement. Examples include your local savings bank, your local credit unions, and small community banks. More detailed examples, Navy Federal, PenFed, and Alliant Credit Union. So now we understand where we can get funding from. That's your banks and credit unions. We also understand the different categories or different tiers that banks and credit unions might fall into. When applying for funding, it's essential to know which credit bureau, banks, and credit unions pull information from during the assessment process. Experian and TransUnion, and the information on these reports can differ. By being aware of the specific bureau a lender relies on, applicants can proactively review their credit reports, identify potential inaccuracies, and address any issues that might impact their credit score. So let's say, for example, your credit reports they're not looking so good on two of your credit reports. So let's say your Experian and your Equifax credit reports are very, very poor. 
but your TransUnion credit report is very good. So you do not want to walk into a financial institution that pulls your credit report from Experian or Equifax in this case, because they're gonna see that, hey, your profile doesn't look so good, and they're either gonna deny you or give you very low limits. But since your TransUnion profile looks very good, you can walk into an institution, they're only gonna take a look at your TransUnion profile, and they're gonna say, hey, this person's profile looks pretty good, and then they're gonna go ahead and wanna work with you more. All right, so that's a good reason why you wanna understand where credit unions and banks do pull your credit report from, right? Now, one tool that you can use to help you to figure out where financial institutes pull your credit report from is creditboards.com. Creditboards.com is a valuable resource for individuals seeking insights into where financial entities pull credit information from. They offer a community-driven platform for credit-related discussions and advice. This knowledge will empower you to present the strongest possible credit profile, enhancing the chances of approval and securing more favorable funding terms. All right, so creditboards.com, super powerful website. Do check it out. And I'm planning to do a video later on showing you step-by-step -step how to actually navigate creditboards.com, all right? Because it is a good platform, but it can be a little bit complicated. So I'll be showing you that later on as well. But do check out creditboards.com. You can also YouTube creditboards.com to see how other people are using the platform, but it's super important to know which credit bureaus they're gonna pull from when you're going in for funding, all right? So do check that out there. Okay, so let's imagine for a second that your personal credit profile is in good order. Your business entity is correctly structured and you've taken a look at all of your credit reports and you've decided which financial institution, which bank and which credit union you actually wanna go into to seek funding. Let's take a look at the importance of building trust and relationships for funding success with that bank or credit union. Building relationships with banks and credit unions before applying for personal or business funding is like laying out the groundwork for a successful financial journey. It's not just about numbers. It's about trust and understanding. When you know the people at your financial institution and they know you, there's a level of credibility that can work in your favor. Discussing your financial needs with them allows for tailored advice and insights into the best funding options available. Having a positive relationship often leads to more favorable terms and a simplified application process, which in the end makes the entire experience a lot smoother and a lot more profitable. Plus, it's not just transactional. It opens the door to specialized services, financial education, and ongoing support. It's like having a financial ally, someone who knows your story and is there to help you navigate the financial goals with confidence. Relationships are everything. You want to have a good relationships with persons in the bank and you want to have a good financial relationship with the bank itself. And we're going to show you how to do that in a moment. And one thing that I want you to note, once you have a good relationships with these institutions, right? And you're able to go in and get funding. You can now leverage that relationship to actually start a funding business and to refer other people over to that bank. And you can start a business that way and earn some good money on people that you're able to get funding, right? So the relationships are not just for you. It can spiral off into bigger ventures if you actually nurture those relationships, right? So start those relationships and nurture them. All right, so let's take a look at how we can actually start some relationships with lenders and how to go about it the correct way. So financial institutions such as banks and credit unions, they work in 90 day cycles. What does that mean? That means that the level of support, resources, and funding they offer to you depends on the quality of relationship that you have built with them for at least 90 days. Now, in simplified terms, the longer your relationship with a financial institution is, the better that relationship is. One of the worst things that you can do is ask for funding or personal or business products the exact same day you join a financial institution. Think about it like any other relationship. Let's say you meet someone that you really like, you really admire, and you want to build a positive relationship with them. But on the first day, you're asking them for $10,000. That's not going to go anywhere, right? They're not going to see you as someone that's going to be fruitful in their life or someone that they can grow with. You're going to always seem as if you're someone who will be taken from them and not giving them anything in return. Now, whether this is in your personal life, your business life, or any aspect of life at all, this principle will carry through. You have to build mutually beneficial relationships with people, with businesses, and with entities if you're gonna actually ask them for anything. So they must be able to see that, hey, I'm able to help this person, this person is able to help me. So in a nutshell, it takes at least 90 days for you to build a meaningful relationship with a financial institution because they work in 90 days cycle. 
you have to show them over a period of time, at least 90 days, that you will be a reliable individual and business entity for them to invest in. All right, so that's the concept behind building relationship with lenders. And let's take a look at how you can actually build this relationship within that 90 days. How to build relationship with lenders. The first thing you're gonna wanna do is open a personal savings and personal checkings account. You're also gonna wanna open a business savings and business checkings account. That's four products with an institution. Once you open these accounts, you're gonna wanna make a deposit into each of the accounts a minimum of $100 in total to start. Of course, the amount of money that you put into these accounts all depends on your cash flow. The more money you put in, the more beneficial it will be in the long run. If you can only do $100, that's totally fine. Start with $100. If you can do $10,000 and spread this across all four accounts, then do $10,000. Now, once you've opened these accounts and you've made the initial deposits, you're going to want to follow it up every two to three weeks for 90 days with consistent deposits into these accounts. You're gonna to wanna to do this just to show that you have a cash flow and that you're looking to do long-term business. So every two to three weeks, you're gonna deposit some more money into these accounts, especially into your business check-ins account. So if it's only $30 that you can do, do $30. If you can do $500 into this account every two to three weeks, do $500. All right, just be consistent. Every two to three weeks, make consistent deposits into these accounts. Now, let's say, for example, you have a business that you want to scale and you need $100,000 to scale your business to the next level. And there are four institutions that you think you can get $25,000 in business funding from. So you want to start a relationship with these four institutions. You want to go ahead and open a personal savings and check-ins as well as a business savings and check-ins account with all of these institutions. And then you're going to want to start making some deposits into these accounts once you have made the initial deposits to open the accounts. Then you're going to follow this up every two to three weeks for 90 days and you're going to be consistent to build a relationship over time with these four institutions. All right. So that's a good example there. And once you build those relationships, the next step is that you can actually go ahead and you can ask about their products. So on the 91st day, you can go ahead and inquire about their products or ask for credit cards or business funding. You are likely to get very high limits because of the quality of relationships you built with these institutions. Once you're approved for business funding, do remove the inquiries and then move on to the next lender because these inquiries will not show on your personal side. So basically, once you get approved for business products, business credit cards or business funding, the inquiries are not going to show up on the personal side on your personal credit report. So it is safe to actually remove those inquiries. However, if you're approved for products on the personal side, you do not want to remove those inquiries because they're going to show up on your personal side. And if you do remove those inquiries, it can result in those accounts and those products being closed. All right. So only on the business side and you have to check to ensure that it doesn't show on the personal side when it's related to business funding. Right. All right. So I have another gem for you here. As mentioned earlier on in this presentation, creditors are going to look at your credit mix. They're going to look at what kind of credit accounts you have when they're determining if they want to give you funding. So one of the things that they do like seeing on your credit report is a good installment loan. So a good installment loan to get is a pledged loan with a credit union, as this is a great way to boost up your profile and qualify you for higher limits. Examples of pledged loans are the Navy Federal Pledge Loans. Most credit unions have these pledge loans, so you just have to inquire about them and go ahead and get them. So how it works is basically you can take out a pledge loan for, let's say, $1,000. And then you're going to quickly pay off $900 of that $1,000, right? And then you're going to make an agreement with the institution that the outstanding $100, you're going to pay this off over a period of, let's say, 10 months. So you're going to pay $10 every month for 10 months. And this installment loan or pledge loan is going to be reflecting on your credit profile and it's going to look really, really good. It's going to look healthy and it's going to be working in your favor. So let's say you've had this installment loan for three months on your account. That's great. When you go in for funding, it's going to make you look super good. At six months, it's going to make you look superb. And by 12 months, you'd have a paid off loan on your account, which is going to make you look very, very excellent. All right. So a pledge loan is a good option for an installment loan. There are other installment loan options as well, but definitely check out the pledge loan with your local credit union. All right. OK, so hope that is clear. Hope that makes sense. And in this section, we've seen the importance of starting relationships with lenders and financial institutions such as banks and credit unions. We've seen how to start relationships, how to build relationships 
and how to maintain these relationships, right? I also want to say, once you do qualify for funding and you do get access to funding, the process of relationship building doesn't stop there. Keep making consistent payments because later on down the road, once you've gone ahead and you go back to them again, they're going to take a look at your relationship that you've built with them over that period of time. And they're going to say, wow. So for the last two years, this guy has been really, really working with us. Let's give him a million dollars this time. <laughs> All right. So that's really possible. So keep building those relationships, keep working on them. And I'll see you in the next section where we're going to talk about four credit unions that you can actually go into right now build these relationships and get a minimum of $10,000 on a rainy Saturday morning in February. All right, so let's take a look. All right, in this presentation, we've covered a lot. We've taken a look at your personal credit profile, how to set up your business entity, and just now we looked at how to build real profitable, worthwhile, long-term relationships with lenders. So now I wanna show you four super good credit unions that you can use to apply everything you learned here today to get access to a minimum of $10,000 in funding on the personal and business side. All right, so we're unveiling four credit unions that offer a minimum of $10,000 to brand new businesses. So doesn't matter if your LLC is brand new, doesn't matter if it, it is 10 years old, right? So whether you're starting fresh or expanding, these financial allies could be your key to funding success. Let's explore them together. And this credit union is Service Credit Union. Now, what I really, really love about Service Credit Union is its strength and support. Service Credit Union is known for its robust support system. It offers personalized services to its members. With a commitment to assisting businesses at every stage, they stand out for their flexible financing options and their commitment to member success. So as I mentioned, credit unions are member-based and they're there to make you succeed. And Service Credit Union is big on member success, right? So it's super, super dope credit union. And I definitely recommend that you join it. Now, one thing that I really appreciate from Service Credit Union is that they allow you to get two products on one inquiry. They will give you a personal credit card and a personal line of credit or a personal credit card and a business credit card on one inquiry and they pull from TransUnion. So definitely go ahead check out service credit union join their platform it's 100 online and start building a relationship with them as i showed you next on the list and what i like about sun east credit union is its tailored solutions their emphasis on understanding individual needs allows for customized funding options making them the go-to choice for entrepreneurs seeking personalized support there are several ways to become a member of the Sun East Federal Credit Union, but the easiest way is to join the Sun East Foundation. You can join for a donation of $10 and it goes towards a worthy cause. Third on the list, we have Apple Federal Credit Union. Apple Federal Credit Union is deeply rooted in community values, reflecting in their commitment to local businesses. Their focus on fostering community growth makes them an excellent choice for entrepreneurs looking for a financial partner with a strong local impact. One thing I should also add is that Apple Federal Credit Union, they love working with people with lower credit scores. So let's say your credit score is about 600, 630, not so sexy, not so good. Apple Federal Credit Union, they are the place that you want to go to. They will work with you. They will help you to build up your credit and they will extend funding options and lines of credit, personal credit cards, business credit cards to you. All right. So super, super cool credit union here, Apple Federal Credit Union. Now to join Apple Federal Credit Union, you need to first become a member of one of their platforms, which is the Friends of the W and OD Trail. It costs just $20 a month. This, well, I think it's $20 one-time payment and their website is wodfriends.org. So you can definitely join the Apple Federal Credit Union there. There are other ways to join, but this is the easiest way to join. And they also pull from TransUnion. Super, super, super cool credit union here. The fourth credit union where you can get $10,000 in business or personal funding within the next 90 days is is PenFed Credit Union. Now their commitment extends beyond financial services. Recognized for its support to military community, PenFed stands out for providing comprehensive financial solutions to both military and civilian members, making them a versatile and inclusive choice for businesses. All right, so now we've broken down this entire business funding game and how you can access funding to start and scale your businesses. If you have questions, drop them in the comments or message me for assistance. If you found value in this presentation, comment the word value along with something you learned. For deeper guidance, reach out, I'm here to help. Share your success with the group and here's to a day filled with peace and lifelong prosperity. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is Therion from VirtueFinancials.com. Have a wonderful day.